Do you like options? They put decision making in your decision making, so you can decide while you decide. Welcome to Trials of Fire, a deck building roguelike RPG that lives up to its name. You are in charge of a team of three heroes, embarking on a dangerous quest that will challenge you to manage risk and reward. Choose and equip your team carefully, lest the lands claim their bones. One of the unique things about Trials is that while elements of the game will unlock as you play, you also have the option to gain access to all unlockables right away with just a single click inside the options menu. I don't know if I'd recommend this path, as the game offers a lot of room for mastery, but it is there nonetheless. Just know that the unlocks are the only permanent progression in the game. There will not be any carryover upgrades like buildings or character perks. There are multiple quests to choose from, as well as combat-only arena climbs of Combat Run and Boss Rush. These quests incorporate some RPG elements, like overworld travel and party resource management, as an additional layer over the deck building and tactical combat. I find the true strength of the game in the latter, but the travel and exploration does break up the weight of combat a bit. So, like I said, decisions, decisions. If you do choose to play a traditional quest, you will find yourself needing to manage time and food carefully. Enemies will become stronger with each day that passes, and your team will wear out and need a chance to eat and recover. The morale bar will affect the armor and quality you enter battle with, and letting the fatigue bar get low will add junk cards to your character's decks. These mechanisms exist to prevent you from grinding your way to godhood, so you will need to weigh the opportunity costs of going out of your way for fights, or just taking what crosses your path between objectives. Each fight you take offers significant rewards, at least one level for a character, plus the chance for food, herbs, and equipment. You will find yourself unsuccessful in your quest if you opt to barrel straight for objectives, so how much time you spend leveling is as important as how you allocate your upgrades. As is typical for roguelike games, there's quite a burden of knowledge placed on the player in Trials. You will likely find yourself with a solid team only to be wrecked by a mechanic or boss you could not have known about beforehand. My only complaint about this mechanic is that this is much more tolerable in a game that lasts an hour or two per run. You could spend 5-10 to 10 hours on a quest in Trials, especially when you're new. If this is an aspect to roguelikes you enjoy, you'll find a lot here, as each quest has its own idiosyncrasies to learn. As far as I can tell, this burden is more eliminated in the combat-only runs though, so if this type of gameplay isn't your cup of tea, you can always drink coffee or juice. The combat, however, is where the bulk of the game lies, and is a complete joy to behold. You will need to master both the deck-building side and the tactical combat side in order to be successful. Your characters will start with 9 class cards, as well as some basic equipment. When they level, they will have the opportunity to select from a small subset of better class cards as a replacement for any of these 9, or to upgrade a card already held. In my experience, it is generally better to grab a new card instead of upgrading an existing one, until you have mostly rid yourself of the basic cards. But the true jumps in power level will come from the equipment you find or purchase while adventuring. So much so, that I would consider using herbs to remove class cards from your deck completely, and rely more heavily on the cards that come from your items. This is even more true when you consider that upgrading an item upgrades all of its cards instead of just one. The struggle is that you will have limited opportunity to manipulate your character's decks. Herbs are not particularly plentiful, and honing items to remove the weaker cards is expensive in materials and time. Still, you need to be careful about diluting your decks by filling inventory slots on a whim, just like a true deck builder. Something something, size of your deck, something something, use it. The one caveat to this is the importance of equipment that offers armor to your characters. Each character will only have 10 maximum health. It is armor that provides additional buffer while in battle, and is refreshed for free upon entering a new fight. Because of this, you will want to have armor on all of your characters, and ensure that damage is spread around during a fight to take advantage of these buffers. A character at full health and equipped with 8 armor will appear in battle as having 18 HP, but will not take actual character damage until reduced below 10. You are going to be taking a lot of fights in Trials, and attrition will be a real problem unless you can manage the armor trait effectively. It is for this reason that I suggest you prioritize the armor value for equipment that offers it, even if it means you include slightly weaker cards as a result. Quality is less of a concern. Yes, you will want some, as it will let you discard a character's cards to redraw the same amount. But fights are short enough that there is such a thing as extraneous quality. Having 3 quality available per character in a fight is a pretty good balance, I've found. Though for boss fights, an extra one probably would be welcome. Just don't forget that your morale bar impacts how much quality and armor you'll actually see in battle. There are junk cards that exist as well, called injuries and weaknesses. 
That is, cards that will harm your characters when drawn, akin to curses and such from other similar games. Some items will put these in your decks, as well as events or, if you are playing a quest, fatigue from lack of rest. They can still be discarded for willpower when drawn, but generally should be avoided if possible. However, there is an event that will offer you a weakness in exchange for a legendary item chosen from a list of four. I do think that this is worth the trade, especially early in the game. All of this preparation is for naught if your tactical acumen is not up to scratch once your team hits the battlefield. Because turns are taken between sides instead of units, it is worth your time to organize your team goals for the round before executing any actions. Check for combo strike opportunities via movement prior to spending your damage actions. Unbuffed combo strikes will only hit for one, but a couple of hits between a pair or trio can add up to significant damage. Remember that power cards can be placed on any of your team members, not just the individual who draws the card from their deck. For this reason, you may choose to have one of your characters play a more utility role in combat, and shift items around to ensure that your high damage units will more consistently draw their good actions. In fact, it is likely that your characters will come to roll specialize to quite a degree. You don't need all three characters to be dealing damage in order to win fights, and attempting to do so could result in neglecting your defenses too much. It seems that I'm often sacrificing one of my character's cards to power the other two, and using the ability to hold a card over to the next turn to give a unit some versatility. This is especially true once you start collecting items with heroic cards, as they are one-shot effects you'll want to make count. At the same time, discarding a powerful card to get a kill now is still a solid play. Don't hoard them forever. Additionally, don't forget that you can rewind a non-damaging card play or any play that does not give you any extra information by clicking the willpower well at the top of the screen. Battlefield awareness is a big deal in Trials. You will need line of sight for your ranged attacks, and adjacency for melee and combo strikes, not to mention that movement immediately stops when any unit becomes adjacent to an enemy. Make these mechanics work for you. Set up choke points amongst the terrain, hide from ranged units to force them out into the open, and keep some forced movement effects in your back pocket. I'll say this for the designers, they have a very good selection of mechanics scattered amongst your foes, and depending on your squad, movement-related actions might be quite necessary to mitigate them. Unfortunately, your tactical options will tend to evaporate a bit when you face a boss. Read the boss description whenever you face one by mousing over the unit to examine their talent, and then work to take it away. For that matter, make sure you understand the talents of your own team and how they might work together. Your character talents will work once per turn, and there's a little blue diamond on the bottom of your character avatars on the battlefield to indicate when their talent is active. Legendary items, that's the orange bordered ones, also provide a talent of their own, on top of the character's existing one. That's a lot to keep track of, but it'll be necessary if you hope to tackle the harder difficulties someday. Miles of Fire offers compelling combat, with a substantial helping of deck building, wrapped up in an RPG experience. If you are interested in watching me tackle this game personally, I'll drop a link on the right hand side of the screen taking you directly to my first video in the Forged in Flame series. I'm Gubaji, and I hope you'll join me in the eternal questioning if our free time can handle one more run.